life and works of Abraham Maslow stand as a foundation for humanistic psychology. His guidance, insights, and inspiration gave meaning and direction to the work of each of the men in this film. Their theories and ideas reflect the aspirations and concerns to which he dedicated his life. Psychology before Abraham Maslow was either psychoanalysis or behaviorism. The men whom you will be seeing in this film are leaders of the new unnoticed revolution, which is called the third force of psychology. All of these men have been touched by the mind of Maslow, to whom we dedicate this film. begin our film by asking Dr. Maslow about the history of the development of his concept of self-actualization. Well, to go back to uh, 1935, which is the best place to start, uh, when I came into uh, New York City from the University of Wisconsin and was exposed to all sorts of uh, people, all sorts of ideas, to anthropology. I started writing a book on abnormal psychology, and the question of normal people came up there. Uh, what I did was, without thinking of this as a research, but sort of as a private interest, uh, just the way one does things uh, unofficially, is was to uh, just hang around with uh, people that seemed to me to be uh, unusually strong or lofty, I remember was a word I used, or big, I remember was a word that I thought of then. And there were such people around, I picked them out, and then unofficially just hung around. Two of them were uh, uh, a very admired teachers, and I tried to understand them simply. At first they were a puzzle. Uh, they behaved in a way that I couldn't quite understand. And I tried to figure it out. And that was about the way it started. Uh, it became, um, you might say, a theory, a generalization, when I found for these first two that I was trying to understand these lofty people. Uh, that when I had written to myself in my journals uh, descriptions of each of them and kept on trying to figure them out and then one day this big wonderful uh, click happens when the two descriptions melted into one and there was a theory <laughs> it was a generalization it was no longer just a, a hobby or a casual a personal uh, thing uh, but it became something which suddenly clicked in with all sorts of other things, with the uh, one lecture that Max Wertheimer, in, in his seminar at the New School, one lecture that he had, in which he had introduced us uh, for the first time to Taoism, uh, which I had hardly heard about before. He called it Being and Doing, and it was very important for me. It was an extremely important lecture. About that time also I ran across Kurt Goldstein's uh, organism, and that fitted into this, and slowly, slow, of course there are many other elements, I mean, th but this is figure against the ground, the most important influences. Uh, and then uh, as I worked on this uh, abnormal psychology book and decided to have a chapter on the normal personality, because I figured psychotherapy ought to be for something, that, and my question was, where is it going? What's it all about? What's it for? And found to my amazement that there was no literature on normality or health, nothing. This, uh, this kept on growing then, and uh, I got more and more excited, of course, and uh, sought out more and more individuals, 
uh, tie this in with uh, my great heroes from the past, the ones that I love very much, Jefferson, Lincoln, and so on. And in this way it grew. Essentially, this was a private thing. Uh, it was sort of, uh, that is for a scientific psychologist, for a laboratory man, uh, this was, I didn't think of it as science. It was my private, uh, like my private hobby, you might say. But then it, it slowly began to come into focus because I talked about my private hobbies, you might say, with my classes at, at Brooklyn College. And I lectured around and chatted and discussed and so on until uh, uh, I worked it up pretty well and then let it sit. Uh, that wasn't published for until seven years later, uh, partly because uh, it didn't fit. I still wasn't emancipated from the conception of science, psychology as a science, uh, that I had uh, learned out of my work with animals and with learning and conditioning and so on. Uh, but it clicked when Werner Wolf asked me we had talked about it, and he had a new journal, and then he asked me if, if he might publish it. I was a little timorous, because here I was going to lose my reputation, you know, for fuzzy work, non-scientific work, and so on. But I, I, I did it, with some timorousness, some, some fear, and it, that was about the way it was. And then all sorts of things kept coming in. Other people, other subjects, uh, other ideas, and I've been drawing uh, milk out of it ever since. It's uh, what it amounted to for me was learning to see through the eyes of lofty people. So I learned slowly to see things the way they did, to understand what motivated them, to understand what they valued and what they didn't value. And uh, Oh, to perceive the motivations, the emotions, the humor, uh, on this very, very interesting business of the mystical experiences that they reported to my total surprise. Uh, each of these were texts which I could then uh, pursue uh, in this uh, pioneering research style, you know, it's kind of innovative research. Gardner Murphy was an early pioneer a contemporary of Abraham Maslow. In his book, he talks about the four stages in the creative process. Immersion, organization, inspiration, and evaluation. It seemed to us to be worthwhile to try a brief Seven League Boots uh, journey through the history of some phases of the human potential. It was almost universally agreed that there were four stages in all human creativity. It was first the love of a certain person or place or idea or symbol or tone or color. There was something from which the response to beauty and to love could be nourished forward. That we can still be grateful for as a central idea. Creativity doesn't spring out of dust, it springs out of life. The second idea was that the small child builds up within himself patterns of color or tone or rhythm. The third idea was that when a storehouse of beloved material, colors or tones or pictures or a person has been coordinated in the child's mind, there are periods of sudden creativity, a leap, a creative flame, appearing perhaps in a great moment of a sunset or in a moment of love. And then when the great creative moment, the Fifth Symphony, has taken shape, there is still, as we know from the Beethoven manuscripts, a long period of working it through and making it social, that is, making it more than a personal message, but something that others can share. Carl Rogers, also a contemporary of Maslow, in his work as a therapist, combined the work of the tough-minded scientist with the sensitive work of the therapist. Well, I think that if I were to uh, try to figure out what the 
kind of a contribution I've made to psychology, if I've made any, it is that I bring together two quite extremely divergent views. On the one hand, uh, through 30 years of experience as a clinician, I've really been very close to some of the most uh, sensitive and subjective and inner aspects of individual lives. And then on the other hand, I seem to always be trying to bridge the gap between being a clinician and being a scientist. And the part of me that uh, is uh, interested in science insists on trying to bring these highly subjective and very um, delicate and ephemeral phenomena within the realm of uh, objective investigation. And I don't know whether I have really been uh, too successful in that, yet I do feel that uh, it's in that kind of a realm that uh, psychology is going to advance if it's going to advance at all. I think we've got to be uh, much more clearly aware of what goes on in the inner lives of individuals uh, and then have got to use ingenuity that we haven't used in the past in trying to find ways of objectifying those inner phenomena and of making a, a real science out of them. So that uh, uh, I am not in favor of the what's often thought of as the hard-headed science of psychology un until it gets to the point where it is able to include the sub subjective phenomena that I feel are actually most important. So it's this um, division within me between the, I hope, sensitive clinician and the hard-headed scientist. Uh, it's, it's the working out of that conflict that has been the course of my own life work. Rollo May, also a contemporary of Maslow, is a psychoanalyst by training who has become a humanist and existentialist. In the following sequence, he describes this changing viewpoint. Dr. May, we're interested in the field of psychoanalysis and also the newly developing movement of uh, existentialism. And you represent then a man who bridges the gap between these fields. Could you tell us about how you see yourself fitting in here? Yes. Well, I think that Freud made a tremendously important contribution to our understanding of human beings by his enlargement of uh, the dynamics of life, his discovery of the unconscious is really a way of saying that human beings are infinitely more powerful, more evil, more good, uh, more uh, creative than Victorian man had believed in his narrow categories. Now, the great error of Freud uh, was his endeavor to base this enlarged view of man and man's potentialities on 19th century biology. Now, I always, as a psychoanalyst, though I valued greatly this technique, believed that the view of man was what was wrong and that we had to rediscover an understanding of the human being as human, as the qualities that aren't uh, based upon our relationship with instinctual thought, but the qualities that make man uh, distinctively man qualities of freedom, responsibility, will, decision, uh, and uh, the higher levels of uh, consciousness. Now this is what the existential movement has stood for. I was an existentialist long before I ever heard of the movement. It's an endeavor to uh, take man as human and take the qualities of responsibility, uh, freedom, uh, as uh, basic. Now, I think that this can be allied, and needs to be, with the depth insights of psychoanalysis. And this is what uh, I, as a humanist, many ways the term humanist is better than existential in this category, I, as a humanist, am devoted to doing. Paul Tillich was the greatest theologian of his time. His book, The Courage to Be, best describes the humanistic goal for the life of man. Dr. Tillich, the problem of man today has been called the management of his anxiety. And you've written this book called The Courage to Be. 
Could you tell us what you mean by this? Oh, I understand. And uh, courage to be, the courage to say yes to life in spite of all the negative elements in human existence, his finitude, that means his coming from nothing and going to nothing, having to die, his guilt and despair, because he is estranged from what he truly is and therefore ought to be, his uh, question of the meaning of life and the uh, anxiety of losing the meaning of his life. And in spite of all this, which the men of our time experiences so deeply, to say yes to life, life has an ultimate meaning, and I will live and actualize it. That's uh, about what my position is. Could you say then that to say yes to life is to affirm life? Or could you expand on the word affirm, or to say yes? To have the courage to see in the reality around us and in us something ultimately positive and meaningful, uh, and live with it, even love it. Loving life is perhaps the highest form of the courage to be. Very good. Frederick Perls was the originator of Gestalt therapy. In the sequence which follows, he describes the necessary journey from deadness to aliveness, which must be the journey of every humanistically oriented man. A few years ago, I came across a paper book called A Cow Can't Live in Los Angeles cow can't grow in Los Angeles. And there was a Mexican wetback who smuggled his relatives into the country. And he told them, look here, the gringos are a very nice kind of people. But there's one point where they are very touchy. You must not let them know that they are corpses. Now this is exactly what I like to demonstrate and what Gestalt therapy stands for. To make living, genuine living people, again out of those corpses. Now this corpse-like behavior is not restricted to the states of course. It's part and parcel of every modern man, especially if he lives in competition with a machine. He has to be without emotions like a machine. He has to be reliable and he has to be without individual intentions, wishes and so on. Now the life of those people become very boring, empty. And the result is more and more dissatisfaction, more and more creation of artificial uh, entertainment called fun. We have replaced fun for happiness genuine encounter, genuine being together, love by public relations, and so on and so on. Now all I try to do is now to get hold of finding out how we have petrified our being into a character, playing a role, often playing a phony role without any support from our heart, without any support from our wish to be, to live, to breathe. So when we start to work on this, of course we come first across these roles we are playing, the deadness, the desert. And it's very difficult for us to realize, to accept the fact that we are dead, that we are missing out on being alive, of being human again. Viktor Frankl, the originator of the School of Logotherapy, writes about man's search for meaning, which has had such a profound effect on American humanistic psychology. Let's now speak of happiness in general. Let's take up the American uh, uh, concept of pursuit of happiness. My contention is 
that it is the very pursuit of happiness that makes and accounts for, uh, for failure. And this is due to the following fact. As I see it, man is primarily motivated by his will to meaning, that is to say, due to his self-transcendent property, striving, one could say, for a reason to be happy, be it that he has encountered another human being through love, or that he has fulfilled a meaning, that is to say, through uh, work in the service of a cause beyond ourselves, a cause greater than ourselves. But primarily, man is not concerned with anything within himself but something or someone outside himself. Now, once he has established such a reason to be or to become happy, I would say happiness is established as a byproduct by way of a side effect. In other words, happiness must ensue. And that is why it need not be pursuit. But how come that it cannot even be pursued? That this pursuit of happiness is doomed to failure? This is due to the fact that to the same extent we are concerned with happiness itself, directly striving for it, making it our target, aiming at it, to the same extent we necessarily must lose sight of any reason to be happy and therefore happiness itself must fade away. This is why, although I'm very sorry, I simply must contradict a paragraph in the American Declaration of Independence because I deem the pursuit of happiness is self-defeating. Alan Watts is a contemporary important philosopher who has given man's search for identity new meaning. In the following sequence, he talks about the term unconscious in a different way. It seems to me that the psychotherapist today is confronted with two sorts of problem that are really rather novel for him. Because to a very great degree, he's taking the place of the priest now, he's not just a specialist who is dealing with deviant and aberrant forms of human being. He is becoming increasingly the guide philosopher and friend to people who would ordinarily be considered average and normal. Now, in this position, it seems to me that he's dealing very largely with the problem of man's sense of identity. That is to say, who the average individual feels that he is, what he feels that he is. And in this respect, you see, the average individual has a problem because he's confronted with what Eric Fromm has called alienation. Alienation is the sense of feeling estranged from everything outside yourself. The sensation of confronting a social world and a natural world that is foreign to you and that stands over against you as something to be mastered. Now this is a way of sensing one's existence that is in a special way peculiar to members of the Western world. To feel that I am a mind or a self enclosed in a wall or bag of skin confronted by an external world that is not me. Now more and more the psychotherapist begins to be aware that this is a false sensation. That it's some uh, kind of uh, way of feeling into which we have been tricked by our education and by our upbringing. We, for example, ignore the fact that the individual and his environing world go together in the same way that two sides of a coin, the back and the front, go together. 
or that a figure and its background go together. You can't have one without the other. For example, you're looking at me, and if you could see nothing outside the outline of my head, you wouldn't be able to see my head. You would see eyes and nose and mouth, but the head you would not see. In order that there should be this outline confronting you, there must be, together with it, the background, which in our ordinary, in our ordinary logic is not the head. But the head and its background, if we are to see them, go together. And so in the same way the individual and the environment are like two poles, two aspects of one life. Now ordinarily you see we are not aware of that. And so one of the great tasks of psychotherapy seems to me to enable us to be aware of that, to enable the individual to feel fundamentally at home in his world. And in this way he comes to have a new grasp, a new dimension to the meaning of what used to be called the unconscious, the importance of making the unconscious conscious. Because you see, uh, in the old schools of psychotherapy, whether they're of Freud or whether they're of Jung, the unconscious has largely been thought of as something within us, a sort of depth it might be a neurological depth, processes that are neurological and that we're not ordinarily aware of, just as we're not aware of our uh, glands functioning, or something even deeper than neurology, as it were, an unknown dimension of an inward soul. But more and more it becomes clear that the unconscious is not merely something inside us, but something vastly outreaching that it includes all kinds of social influences on us that we are not normally aware of, all kinds of influences of the natural environment. You see, a human being derives his meaning, his identity, from his context in the same way as a word in a sentence gets its meaning from its context. See, the one word bark can have different meanings in a different sentence. And so the human being has different meanings in accordance with the context he's in. So if the setting makes the man, there is a sense in which the setting is the man. We end our film by asking Dr. Maslow about the future, about his ideas for research, and his ideas about the concept of self-actualization. Yes, I'd enjoy speaking about that. I, th I think some things ought to be cleared up. Uh, first of all, uh, speaking as a scientist uh, and speaking to our students, uh, the students who might be seeing this, I want, to, no, let me say it this way, that I thought of myself in this situation as in others. I, I like pioneering. I like breaking open a new field. I get bored with it when it gets settled. Uh, and this sometimes looks, if you have a limited notion of science, this looks like, well, it's unscientific. Now, by the criteria of good scientific research, this is certainly not the finished uh, research. It's not even uh, a good research. I prefer to use the word investigation, exploration. Now, for me, obviously, the next step is research. Uh, these are, they could be called, all of them, a set of hypotheses, uh, plausible on the basis of one person's investigation of, of a group of people. But of course, they have to be checked. They have to be confirmed and disconfirmed. And uh, I think it's uh, time for the, uh, for the testing, for the, even the, the testing in the sense of quantification, like, like your test. Uh, and to start gathering the uh, piles and the masses of data on each of these, after all, that description amounts to a hundred hypotheses, each of which remains to be confirmed or disconfirmed. One of the things I'd like to do, um, uh, to be able to talk like people who are about to die in 24 hours and then who would be freed from striving, ambition, competition, and who would get down to the bedrock of life. 
1954, Abraham Maslow wrote Motivation and Personality, which was the beginning of humanistic psychology. In 1970, just shortly before his death, he revised this book. In this new revision, he talks about humanistic psychology as a new general comprehensive psychology and philosophy and says the following. This new humanistic psychology seems to be a new and far more hopeful and encouraging way of conceiving of any and every area of human knowledge. Economics, sociology, biology, and every profession. Law, politics, medicine, and all the social institutions, the family, education, and religion. The men you have seen in this film, each in his own way, has written and theorized about this field of humanistic psychology. The magnificence of these men will shine as examples for every man in the humanistic psychology of tomorrow.